Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Hopefully you have your Christmas decorations up, if you have any, and you've been enjoying that festive and kind of cozy atmosphere that trees and lights and ornaments give you. And then, how many of you have been getting into the Christmas spirit with some Christmas movies? Now, maybe you could be watching some old classics like It's a Wonderful Life or White Christmas, or maybe a modern classic like Elf. I'm going for Elf. If you like How the Grinch Stole Christmas, then you have options. You've got the old animated one, the live action one, or that like second, more recent animated Grinch. Maybe your go-to Christmas movie is that one, uh, what's it called? It's the one where there's like an overmatched hero facing off against a group of nefarious criminals. Oh, you know, Die Hard or Home Alone. Uh, They're kind of the same. Now, personally, when it comes to picking a Christmas movie, I love A Christmas Carol. My Christmas season has not begun until I watch an adaptation of the old classic Dickens tale. I think this goes back to seeing staged performances with my mom like most years and then reading the book in middle school. Somewhere along the line, my love for the carol was cemented, and I was happy to watch any adaptation that came out that year. I mean, I remember in 2004, there was like a TV musical with Kelsey Grammer as Scrooge, and I can still hear Marley singing link by link by horrifying link. Now, this year, uh, Spirited came out, and then a couple years ago, there was a darker take that, like, the BBC and FX made together, and I love all of them. Any of them. Well, not the weird motion capture Jim Carrey one that came out, like, a few years ago, because that is just unsettling and unpleasant. We don't need that. And just in case, like, we have a year where there's just no new Christmas carols out, Well, then there's The Muppets Christmas Carol. That's a classic, and that one's always an acceptable watch. But maybe none of these are really your speed. You would rather watch one of the never-ending made-for-TV Christmas movies on Hallmark Channel, Lifetime, or even Netflix is getting in on the game now. All of those movies that are, well, in my opinion, weird, ridiculous, and oddly the same. Honestly, sometimes I hear about the plots of some of these movies, and I just cannot even tell if they're for real. So in fact, with that spirit, we're going to play a quick game. I'm going to read you two possible plot summaries to go with the title of a real Hallmark Christmas movie. One of them is going to be the real one. One is a made-up one. And then you're going to vote on which one you think is the real deal. If you have seen the movie, don't shout it out. Just vote and be confident in your answer. Okay, first one, first, first option. Which one of these is the real plot for the movie Christmas CEO? Is it A, a profit-hungry toy maker attempts to merge her company with a mega, mega toy company, but is faltered by her ex-partner's refusal to sign the merger agreement? Or is it B, when Santa falls ill, his daughter and North Pole Inc.'s HR rep must take over his business duties and act as CEO. Okay. Lock in your answers. What do you think? Is it, who thinks it's option A? Raise your hand if you think it's option A. Okay. Now, raise your hand if you think it's option B, the one about Santa's daughter. Okay. Most of you, most people say option B. Well, I'm here to disappoint you. The correct answer was option A. I'm going to be honest, B sounds like a much better movie than A. (laughs) I'm not interested in A at all. Okay, second one. One, Again, one of these is real. One of these is a real movie called Cranberry Christmas. Again, is Cranberry Christmas A? Uh, After a freak weather event ruins their crops for the year, a couple must turn their cranberry farm into a bed and breakfast to make ends meet. That sounds pretty cozy, pretty Christmassy. Or B, 
The married owners of a cranberry farm must reconcile their business differences when they are forced to work together on the Cranberry Christmas Festival. (laughs) Okay, think about it. Okay, who thinks it's option A? Okay, a few on option A. Now, who thinks it's option B? Okay, again, most people are going for option B, and it is, it's option B. This one's option B. Although, again, I think the fake plot sounds better. (laughs) Okay, here's our last one. Last one. This movie is called Catch a Christmas Star. So which is the real Catch a Christmas Star? Is it A, the daughter of a widower attempts to reunite her father with his high school sweetheart who just happens to be one of the biggest pop stars on the planet? Or is it B, A workaholic weather woman has to make the choice between work and her family when a major astronomical event happens on Christmas Eve. Okay, so think about it. And again, you want to pick the right one, not the one that you necessarily think you'd rather watch. Um, What do you think is the real movie? Option A. Who thinks it's option A? Okay, good mix. Who thinks it's option B? Okay, I think, again, we had a few more option Bs. I think a lot of people are just following the test kind of strategy of just B, fill in B every time. Um, this one is A. It's option A. It's about the daughter of a widower reuniting her father with a pop star. Now, how do you guys feel? Who, who did well? Wait, raise your hand if you got, like, two out of three. I'm going to see. Oh, or three out of three? Good job. I don't have a prize for you. Um, yeah, so Dave got three out of three. Congratulations. You get to live with that now. You, you, you now have to live with yourself. Um, honestly, in, all, in my opinion, all of these movies just sound so absurd to me. But I'll be honest, maybe I do understand, maybe some of you love the comfort of watching movies about hot single business women, finding hot single dads to date, or a movie about a, a small business on the verge of bankruptcy that is saved at the 11th hour, probably by that hot single dad. Um, or, you, or, you know, you, you appreciate a good movie about children wishing for family togetherness, and that wish is granted. Now, all of these movies, they come and they're marketed with this promise of, like, holiday magic and a Christmas miracle. Although, most of these Christmas miracles are really just kind of ordinary events that most people experience at some point in their life, like finding love or discovering a profitable business model. But they feel miraculous because they occur in the midst of snow and holly. And, and, and maybe I sound a bit cynical because, again, I understand there are clearly people who love these movies. There's like a hundred of them every year. And, and even though they're like all the same, I know they're constantly playing on my mom's TV. So maybe the reason these made-for-TV Christmas miracles are so appealing is because they kind of play to what we think is possible, and they inspire just a little bit of hope around Christmas. Maybe, just maybe, a young daughter can reunite her father with a famous pop star. Maybe the Christmas celebration can reunite an estranged couple of cranberry farmers. And maybe, just maybe, a career-driven woman can have a successful toy company and a hot husband, right? That's kind of what all of these Christmas movies do. They're all about hope or miracles. Even the big screen ones, they're about hope. They're about miracles. Even Die Hard. You know, that's a movie about a man reuniting his family at Christmas time, despite great odds. (laughs) Now, and even though many of the Christmas miracles in all these movies are not actually all that miraculous, they are something that we can and we perhaps need to believe is possible in our own lives, like finding love or family or success, even for the most cynical of us all. And so what about you? Do you need a Christmas miracle? Do you need the hope that comes with all of these Christmas movies? Now, Christmas is a natural time to look back as we practice family traditions, as we remember past Christmases, just as we did a couple weeks ago. But it's also a time for looking forward. It's the end of one year, and the new year's just like a week away. So at this time, we start to look ahead, maybe with dreams and resolutions or or dread and despair for the new year. What do you see for your future? Do you think a, a better future is possible for you? What do you think is possible this Christmas season? Now, in A Christmas Carol, a movie that actually kind of has some actual miracles as ghosts come to visit and haunt Scrooge and convince him to change his way, 
the final ghost we meet is the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And it's a ghost that shows Scrooge his future, and it is a future without grace and repentance. It is dark, and it's depressing, and it's tragic. The ghost of Christmas past, he helped Scrooge sort through and integrate his own past. The ghost of Christmas present helped him to see his fellow man and discover a sense of empathy in the here and now. But faced with his yet to come, Scrooge finds himself in need of hope, in need of hope for change, for grace, and for redemption. So Scrooge has to ask about his future. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Does your future feel hopeless and set in stone? Perhaps you relate to feeling worn out trying to be a better version of yourself, feeling guilt or pressure about doing more, being more, accomplishing more, feeling tired of trying to measure up to other people's standards, or feeling tired of trying to make uh, plans for a new and better you, only to find yourself stuck in the same place as always, or feeling, feeling disappointed at a year that has left you exhausted and hurt with no idea as to what comes next, or unable to decide if God is pleased with you or disappointed in you. Or maybe you, feel you relate to wanting to grow and change but you're not really sure how that happens. As we come to the end of the year and as we prepare for Christmas, let's stop and think about our own future, our yet to come. How do we feel? Do we need a Christmas miracle? Do we feel like there is hope? Or do we fear the shadows of what will be much like Scrooge does? Throughout this series, we've been considering how the coming of Christ at Christmas time, a visitor who's much cuter than Scrooge's ghost, how that speaks to our past and to our present. And today, let us consider our yet to come and ask how the birth of a baby born 2,000 years ago impacts our future today. We're going to turn to Luke 2 this morning in case you want to follow along in your Bible. Last week, we considered Jesus' actual birth. But this week, we're going to look at some events that happen right after, actually specifically eight days later. We see in Luke that Mary and Joseph, who are faithful Jews, brought Jesus to the temple in order to present him to be blessed and circumcised according to tradition. At the temple, they meet Simeon, a man that we are told was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, the Bible doesn't actually say, but traditionally it is thought that Simeon was pretty old. That seems to make sense based on what we are told about him. Like, you know, that's why it would be significant and worth mentioning that he was promised by the Spirit of God that he would not die and would live to see the Messiah until he saw the Messiah. Now, even if you had been made that promise, I imagine after long enough, it would be easy to lose hope. I mean, how long could you wait for something? As a people, Israel had been waiting for centuries. And personally, Simeon had been waiting his whole long life. But here he is today, still faithfully waiting as the Spirit of God is clearly with Simeon, leading him to the temple to finally meet his Savior that day. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby, G- sorry. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God saying, "Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations." And he is the glory of your people, Israel. First, Simeon responds with praise. He knows that this child is the promised Savior, and he experiences the full hope of salvation in this baby. Imagine waiting your whole life for something, and it just totally lives up to your expectations, or even beyond. It blows them out of the water. Simeon has no doubt. 
He recognizes God and God's salvation in this child and knows that its impact will be for all people and all nations. And he also reminds us that this infant reveals God to us. This is so important. It's something to remember as we consider the Christmas story. Yes, Jesus is God, but also God is Jesus. God is revealed to us through Jesus Christ. The difference between those two, that Jesus is God and God is is Jesus, is a little more than semantics because it, it helps us to recognize that what we learn about Jesus and his character teaches us, teaches us about God's character as well. And that should inspire hope in us. Because the truth that God came to us, that God was born as one of us, embodied in a little vulnerable baby who would experience the disappointments of life, the pain of betrayal, and the worst suffering that human life has to offer can change everything that we understand about God and everything that we thought is possible. Because it is God's answer to all of our questions about pain and grief, about our struggles now and looking forward. If we think we are alone, hopeless, and uncared for, Christmas reminds us that God came to us as a baby. God's answer to our pain and to our suffering, to the evil in the world, was to enter into it, experience it, and bear it for us. If you're looking ahead and you're struggling to see God and hope in your future, Christmas reminds us that God has tread that ground already and that he walks it again with us, even now. Simeon's proclamation and prophecy must have been quite the spectacle because Luke tells us that Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. And remember, Mary and Joseph, they've been visited by, they've each been visited by angels who are foretelling Jesus' birth and his role in the world. They've had shepherds come in from like the fields and find them in a city um, because they had been visited by like a chorus of angels and th- that sent them there. All of this amazing things have happened and yet Mary and Joseph still have room to be amazed. But Simeon is not finished as we continue in verse 34. Then Simeon blessed them. He said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. The infant Jesus may provide comfort, but also great challenge. Many will oppose him and their hearts will be revealed in how they respond to him. So as we consider our response we consider if we are humble enough to receive, salva- receive salvation from this baby. Because that's not only awe-inspiring that God would humble God's own self and come to us as an infant. It's also humbling to think that when we needed saving, God sent a baby. If we think we can a- attain worth, approval, assurance, or comfort all on our own strength, or that any of that may depend on us, Christmas reminds us of how much we depend on a baby. Now, I have a baby, and he's, pretty ex- he's a pretty excellent baby in my objective opinion. Pretty solid. But it's hard uh, to look at him and not be filled with thoughts of all that I need to do. I need to change his diaper. I need to get his bottle ready. I need to help him settle down and sleep. I need to make sure he's dressed warmly enough to go outside. I need to give him more attention. I need to read him more books. I need to make sure he doesn't hurt himself. It's all about what I need to do. It's hard to imagine depending on him for anything. Yet Simeon held the infant Jesus and recognized all that he was. Now we all have a lot of ideas of what we need to do. When we are challenged to let go and depend on God, I think for many of us, it's less like a point of pride that's being challenged, but it's more a sense of shame and anxiety and like obligation. I mean, if I don't do it, who will? If I fail, won't I disappoint others? Won't I be a failure? I need to do it. And this is what leaves us 
feeling tired and exhausted and hopeless about our future. This is the challenge and the comfort of Jesus at Christmas time. We cannot do it ourselves, but instead we need this little baby. And this should provide us with great hope as well if we are able to receive it. Because it is the ultimate Christmas gift. The hope that can only be received by humbly receiving this child. Paul describes this gift to us in Ephesians 2. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible weight incredible wealth of his grace and of his kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. But God, Paul says. And with two words, Paul changes what we know is possible. He reminds us that what we cannot do, God can. For all of our efforts, we are dead without God. We are dead in our sin and brokenness and human weakness. Nothing we can do or or want to do or need to do comes close. It's all a gift. Well, this salvation is fulfilled on the cross of Good Friday and death defeated in the empty tomb of Easter. It begins on Christmas morning. All a gift given in the form of a baby. It is the gift of grace that makes us alive again. And this life comes with purpose and capability. We can do what is planned for us. We can respond in faith to what is given and live new lives. This is how Jesus' birth 2,000 years ago impacts our yet to come. Jesus' birth gives us hope for the future and for now. This is hope for life. Hope that comes from grace. Hope that great things are possible because our God comes as a baby. Hope that we do not need to do anything but instead receive everything. Remember Scrooge's question for the ghost of Christmas yet to come? Are these the shadows of the things that will be or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Is change possible? Now, I've noticed in some of the recent adaptations of A Christmas Carol that they seem to be a little more interested in questioning uh, Scrooge's redemption than the older ones do. I mean, is it real? Can he really have changed? Why do we want to see a greedy old man be saved? One Scrooge challenges the idea of redemption. I mean, if he changes, won't that simply justify every evil thing he did if it ultimately led him to grace? Another Scrooge questions if his change is real. How can he tell? Has he done enough? Jesus answers all of that with a message of hope and of grace. All can be saved. All can experience grace. This is demonstrated powerfully through the Apostle Paul himself. Paul, who was a classic Scrooge long before Dickens ever wrote his tale, and who was the author of that passage from Ephesians, He experienced his own dramatic visit as Jesus, risen from the dead, appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Before that, Paul was a persecutor and a murderer of Christians, and he was on his way to murder more. He was a man of status and power, prideful and among the worst enemies of Christians and of the church. Yet Jesus came to him, not in the form of of three ghosts the night before Christmas, but instead surrounded by blinding and marvelous light. Jesus declares that even Paul was worth saving. And and Jesus marked his change, not by what Paul did, but through this experience of grace. 
artist and author Ruth Chow Simmons writes about Paul, the reason why Paul, the man who once held the coats of those who stoned Stephen for preaching the gospel, could unswervingly declare that there is now no condemnation for those found in Christ is because grace is infinitely greater than our sin and our shame. Surrendering to Christ did not erase his past. It rewrote his future. Jesus rewrites our futures. He does not erase our past, although he does offer us forgiveness and restoration. But he rewrites what we think is possible, revealing God to us through a helpless, vulnerable baby. Jesus challenges us to receive these gifts of grace. And Jesus' birth gives us hope for the future and for now. When the Savior finally came to him, Simeon recognized him, even in a humble baby, and praised. And when the ghost came to Scrooge, he seizes a new opportunity to write a new future. How will we respond? This Christmas season, consider your past, your present, and your yet to come. As we wrap up this morning, I want to remind you of two practices from the last two weeks and offer one more for us to practice for these next few weeks. It's going to be a little bit before we're back together. And and none of these uh, practices are things that should constantly demand your striving or action, but instead they should be simple practices that can shape our being for these next few weeks of this Christmas season. When we consider our ghosts of Christmas past, uh, Megan Sibrich encouraged us all to start the practice of confession in our prayers. We learned how the destructive patterns of our past maintain their hold on us because we just don't want to deal with them. Too often it feels like looking at them directly, let alone trying to root them out, will feel too painful. But if you bring your sins and hurts honestly before God, you can begin to heal. While trying to keep them clamped down will only lead to a festering wound in your soul. Acknowledge the specific sin, recognize God's forgiveness of you, and affirm God's character, that of compassion, mercy, and love. And when we considered our ghosts of Christmas present, Megan Miller uh, challenged us all to practice presence and to be full of the here and now and not the there and then. This included putting your phone and earbuds away and sitting in the bodily experience of here. And when you find yourself feeling worried or anxious about the past or future, do what you can to acknowledge it and give it to God in prayer and then return to the present now. And now today, as we consider our ghosts of Christmas yet to come, I invite you to worship our Savior this Christmas season. Worship as Simeon worshiped. Recognize the Savior before us. Our worship reminds us about the hope that we have for the future, how grace challenges us and how a baby can give us hope. Sing songs about who God is and about what God does. Since it's Christmas, listen to Christmas carols and to hymns, songs that are about Jesus and about God, and consider what they remind us about our Savior. Or maybe here's another thing. Maybe you need another Christmas movie recommendation. Since we started talking about Christmas movies, I think this is a fair place to finish. So I want to leave you with the movie that I feel best embodies the hope that we experience at Christmas um, and is better than anything I've ever seen in this, in this. A movie that helps us to feel what it truly means to depend on the birth of a baby and to experience the joy of a truly miraculous birth. No, I am not talking about the nativity story. I'm talking about children of men. Now, that is a movie that you will never come across in a Christmas movie marathon. And if you cannot accept Die Hard as a Christmas movie, then I don't think you'll ever believe me that this one belongs as well. But it is a movie about a world where no children have been born in 18 years. It is a broken world with every one of our world's flaws exacerbated by the trauma of mass infertility. That is, until a young woman is found who is pregnant and who needs to get out of Britain to a place where she can safely deliver and raise her child. And eventually her child is born in the midst of a war zone between soldiers and rebels. And the hero of the movie helps, then, to carry this infant out through the fighting armies. And everyone who is fighting 
simply stops the moment they see this impossible child. Everything is still in the midst of this war zone. Even though the baby is still crying, it gives meaning to the hymn, Silent Night, whose, hymn, whose first verse goes, Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. The night is not silent because a baby is quiet, but because for a moment in a chaotic world, there is peace. Suddenly what everyone thought was possible is changed and now there is hope. I recommend this movie to you because I think no other movie has ever helped me understand half as well how the birth of a baby could represent and embody so much hope for the world. Because that is what Jesus actually does. Jesus offers us hope. He reveals God to us. He invites us and challenges us to humbly give up our way, our efforts, and our striving for worth or change or whatever it is we think we need, and instead to accept his grace, his gift of grace and love. This Christmas season, let us, let us look at our yet to come and see the hope that can only come with the miraculous birth of our Savior. Please pray with me. Dear God, wherever we are at today, for those of us who are feeling like our futures are, are not full of much hope or possibility, that we are afraid of the shadows of what will be, help us to see that hope that you give us on Christmas morning with the arrival of our Savior as an infant child. This baby who both reveals God to us and reveals our deep need, Lord. Help us to see that infant for all that he is, just as Simeon does, Lord. Help us to respond with praise and worship, Lord, and with hope. In your holy name I pray. Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.